Hi, yeah, hi, um, and thanks for the opportunity to present our research here today um, about the predictability of temperature presentation streams on decadal and multi-decadal timescales. And I also want to acknowledge my co-authors and co um, collaborators, Yiling Liu, who um, was a PhD student I supervised at UNSW Sydney, and Rashad Mahmoud, Pablo Ortega, and Paco Dobas Reyes, with whom I'm working here at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So, in my talk today, I would like to touch on two different topics that are uh, thought are relevant for this uh, workshop here today. The one um, focuses on the analysis of temperature and precipitation extremes and how predictable they are. I do this or I present this in a perfect model framework um, to avoid all the difficulties with the initialization. Also, that my yes. and in the second part of the talk, I also want to um, briefly show some some exciting new work where we're aiming to do predictions beyond ten years, so beyond basically what the decadal predictions give us, but also transporting this information by essentially constraining the decadal variability in large projection ensembles based on their agreement with decadal predictions. Uh, just briefly, uh, um, this slide for also a bit of background setting. So this is a figure that um, shows how regional climate extremes, in this case is hot extremes, the annual hottest day in the Mediterranean region, how they scale with um, the, the global average temperature increase, in this case, in CMIP5 simulations. And um, we see that essentially these regional extremes scale linearly, roughly linearly, with um, global average temperatures. And um, at a rate that, in this case, for the Mediterranean, is higher than the one to one lines. So the one to one lines, this black one here. So essentially, at a two degree global warming, you would see a three degree increase in regional hot extreme temperatures and we also see that this relationship is independent of the scenario chosen right uh, shown as here two rcp 8.5 and 4.5 scenarios and the, at least the ensemble mean lines are very much on top of each other the main difference is really how how far we move to the right side in terms of global warming and accordingly here to the top in terms of hot extremes um in in, in the larger emission scenarios compared to the lower emission scenarios. And um, this also looks relatively similar um, when we're looking at um, temperature, uh, I'm sorry, at, at precipitation extremes. In this case, it's um, um, the, the um, five-day accumulation in South Asia. And again, um, what I said before, basically is the different scenarios lay pretty much on top of each other. Here we see an intensification of roughly 6% per degree of global warming. And of course, in this case, the, the uncertainties are much wider than they were for, for, the, for the temperature extremes in the Mediterranean. And um, I go back to this in a minute. So given the scenarios here are um, normalized in the, in the kind of plot, so this um, uncertainty is primarily due to the model and the internal variability in these models. And um, this was um, shown or recently decomposed in the paper by Flavio Lena, where um, they disentangled the different uncertainty sources. For example, we see how the different scenarios become more um, different towards the end of the century, but are fairly close to each other in the beginning. And so we see also basically the scenario uncertainty is shown in green here. The model uncertainty in blue, which then decreases as the scenario uncertainty increases. And there's also the internal variability that plays a role here in the first couple of decades for the um, global average temperature. And this has a much larger role if we look into regional projections. In this case, it's the um, Sahel precipitation or summer temperatures in southern Europe, where if we look at the first two to three decades, Essentially, the internal variability is the dominating source of uncertainty in these projections. And this is exactly the uncertainty that we are aiming to reduce in decadal predictions, where we are initializing the climate models towards the observed state of the climate. And this has the, the um, aim to, to essentially 
put the phase of the model into um, or equalize the phase of the model with the observed climate. And these decadal predictions are skillful. Um, so this top map here is, for example, um, based on a multi-model decadal prediction ensemble for temperature project uh, temperature predictions on decadal time scale that are significant almost everywhere, and also precipitation predictions and um, pressure are regionally skillful. And if we compare to the skill um, just from the projections without aligning the decadal or without aligning the internal variability phases, everywhere where we spread here, we show added value basically where the initialization, the phasing in of variability improves the information compared to simply just the forcing. And this is the case in particular over the North Atlantic, but also here into Europe, Africa, Tropic Atlantic, and a few other regions. So this is now for average conditions, average temperature, precipitation, and um, there's only very few studies that have investigated decadal predictability. And one reason why it's very few um, studies is probably because um, analyzing extremes requires large data amounts if we are calculating extremes based on daily data. This, um, of course, blows up things quite a bit. So what I'm showing here is a predictability analysis of temperature and precipitation extreme indices that were calculated from daily data for perfect model setup, essentially where um, we, we have different simulations that start from identical initial conditions with small perturbations, and we measure how well the different realizations can predict the reference of the same model. And this is here also now on decadal timescales over the two to nine year period. And um, so the, the ensemble is much smaller than what we've seen in the previous slide on the multi-model. But uh, what we essentially see and what I want to highlight here is that when we're predicting warm extremes, and this moderate warm extremes that are basically measuring the frequency of being above the 90th percentile, we see a much larger area of, um, of the globe where the, the skill is actually um, significant in comparison to where the mean temperature predictions are significant. Yeah? Basically, in this experiment here, there's roughly 20% of the global surface where the average temperature um, is skillfully predicted, but almost 40% where the warm nights and cold, uh, warm days and cold nights, so which essentially measure the frequency in the upper 10% or in the lower 10% of the of the distribution, are predicted with skill. And um, this is summarized again in in this table, um, the same numbers and the third line here show, shows a similar index, um, but for precipitation, essentially measuring the total amount of precipitation in the top 5% of the wet days. And this is, of course, a much noisier variable spatially and temporarily, um, where also the, the precipitation itself has lower skill, but we have roughly the same skill then also for, for the extremes as we have for the average precipitation. And if we look into more extreme extremes, as I said before, this was more moderate extremes that occur several times per year as they basically have exceed a certain percentile. And the more extreme extremes, which in this case um, measure annual maxima or minima of temperature or precipitation, again, these are then also noisier variables compared to those moderate extremes, they also show significant area of this skill, but it's more comparable to the area where, where actually the mean temperatures or presentation are also skillful. But um, at, at least there's also some indication of predictability for these kind of more extreme extremes. Okay, um, I'm now coming to the second part of my talk in which I want to discuss some developments to provide longer term um, predictions of climate information on near-term climate change beyond the next 10 years provided by decadal predictions. And um, the concept of what we're doing here is illustrated in this schematic figure by uh, Daniel Befort, published last year in GRL. And um, if you imagine the gray envelope in the background here is essentially the, the spread that, that we have based on the projections that are not initialized. And assuming that this spread is roughly constant in time, which of course is a simplification. And the blue envelope here 
shows the decayed predictions, which are initialized close to each other. So they have a, a low spread, but then as they evolve, they become more spread. But after 10 years, when they finish, are probably still smaller in spread than the whole range covered by the projections. And so the idea now is to select those ensemble members of the projections that are more similar to decayed predictions and see if when we analyze those, we can transport some of the added value that we have from the initialization of the decayed predictions into the second decade beyond the 10 years. And the background of this is that decadal predictions are simply very expensive to run because you're initializing them every year and run a whole ensemble of 10 years initialized every year. So this um, is, is not cheap to, to extend them. And so this constraint essentially is one approach to, to um, transport this added value beyond 10 years. And um, we have developed an approach to do this in which essentially for each start year of decadal predictions of the annual initializations, we identify those projections that are most similar to the decadal predictions of the first 10 years and then analyze those projections over, in this case, the next 20 years. Of course, we could also analyze them for 30, 40 years because the, the projections go until the end of the century. But uh, um, we, we start with two decades here to uh, identify them the added value and um, illustrate the concept. And the criterion based on which we are constraining these projections is essentially the global SST anomalies. So this incorporates all the different phase or uh, uh, all the different modes of ocean temperature variability globally. So in particular, the Atlantic and the Pacific um, variability on the cadal time scale. So we use also 10 year averages and then select those um, projection members that are most similar to the pattern that is predicted by the decadal predictions. And um, this is here illustrated based on decadal predictions and projections with the NCAR CSM model, so the large ensemble projections and the decadal prediction large ensemble uh, for, the, for the initialized decadal predictions. And we see in this case where it's not stable, it's significant. We see this essentially significant skill over most areas of the globe if we predict the next 20 years. And on the bottom here, again, we see the added value from the initial conditions basically in this constraint over just having an entire ensemble of projections. And we see that there's added value in particular in, in the North Atlantic, but also subtropical Atlantic, some areas here in the Eastern Mediterranean. And if we now do some projections or the constraint projections for the next 20 years, this is shown here as cumulative probability functions. Essentially, the blue line shows the entire large ensemble of projections. And the red line shows the distribution function of the constrained ensemble. And here we see, for example, so the, the last initialization in this case was 2016 with the, with the NKM DPLE. We're currently doing the same based on SMIP 6, where we also have 2020 initializations to have true predictions. But so this is essentially now 20 years up to 2035. And we see that there's in the Atlantic, there's a tendency towards warmer conditions over the next 20 years compared to the, to the entire um, unconstrained ensemble. And um, this is related to the Atlantic variability. And this also affects areas of the globe that are actually teleconnected with the Atlantic. Yeah? For example, also in the Sahel, we see then a projection of higher summer temperatures over the next 20 years compared to the entire large ensemble. And similar also for, for Western Asia, including the Arabian Peninsula, where again, the, the red curve is shifted towards the left compared to the blue curve of the entire ensemble. Okay, um, this is a brief summary of, of what I've just presented you on, on the two topics on the decadal scale predictability of temperature and precipitation extremes from daily data and um, constraining the projections to have multi decadal climate projections or, or climate predictions essentially. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>